Hi, everyone. It's really great to be here. Um, sort of nothing a speaker likes to hear more than you have 10 more minutes than you thought to give a talk. Doesn't happen very often. So I'm going to uh, exploit that as much as possible here. Um, but I actually changed the title a little bit, even in my talk. I, I previously focused on certified robustness, or at least certified in parentheses. Um, and I, I actually kind of want to, to go beyond that a little bit and just talk about kind of my perspectives on robustness, having worked in the field now for, for about five years. This was actually a pretty, I really started sort of, or I mean, more than this, of course, we started working in it probably six years ago, but sort of our first papers came out about a little bit more than five years ago on robustness. Um, of course, I should mention that this is really is all mostly work um, done, done by my students here. Um, so I'm, I'm showing pictures of my, my students and postdoc who, who've worked on these parties with me. So this is uh, Eric Wong on the left, or left to right here, uh, Eric Wong, Jeremy Cohen, Leslie Rice, Minji Sun, and Huan Zhang. Um, but there's many more collaborators we have, of course. These are just the sort of ones directly in my group I'm highlighting here. Uh, and they and they and the others are, of course, the ones that do you know the vast majority of this of this real work here. So, I want to take this sort of wonderful opportunity to talk to this community, to in some ways kind of give an opinionated take on where we are right now when it comes to robustness. Because it's a field, as I say, that we've been working on for at least five. I mean, it goes well back before this, as I'll also mention. But I've been working on this for at least five years. And if I kind of evaluate it critically, I'm not sure that it's kind of a model field that we want to emulate going forward and have the next five years be just like the past five years. So before I get into all that, though, and my opinions, um, let me jump in and start talking about robustness in machine learning, specifically in the context of adversarial attacks. So I presume I don't need to introduce this picture anymore. Um, this is Alex's famous picture of how machine learning can make pigs fly. Um, and the idea, of course, is that as we all know, machine learning methods, machine learning models have vulnerabilities in them. And you can take a model that works quite well uh, classifying images, add a bit of adversarially chosen noise. And in particular, you sort of find that noise by maximizing, finding the worst case loss over some perturbation set. And what you get in the end is you get a image that looks exactly the same to us, but which is misclassified by the system. And I think this needs no real introduction at this conference at this point. Um, now, there's been... Oftentimes, sort of the recent interest in this, I think uh, Nicola mentioned this also, the recent interest is credited to uh, some papers that kind of occurred in the early 20 teens. Um, but this sort of idea goes back at least 20 years in machine learning and, and really longer than that, right? So this, really, this notion of sort of optimizing the worst case is really kind of the crux of Really the crux of robust optimization, really, which goes back to the 70s, at least probably beyond that if you're tracking these things, really. So this is not fundamentally a new idea, but I do think that its prevalence, especially in deep learning, as these systems got very good, is in fact, you know, a reasonable thing to call kind of a new, a new wave in the field, right? And so... The other thing that I want to emphasize is that this is not just a virtual problem, right? So this, this is a real problem we can manifest not just by manipulating pixels and images, but also by manipulating physical objects. We can cause similar sort of errors in machine learning systems. So one of my colleagues at CMU here um, made some glasses you can print out to make him look like someone else. Um, you can put stickers on, we've all probably seen that stop sign picture of stickers on stop signs that change it to a speed limit sign. Um, some students at MIT had a paper on like 3D printing a turtle that would be classified as a rifle. Um, and I had some work with a student on creating patches that would sort of suppress all detections of object detectors. All right, so th these are things that, that are not just virtual, these are real in some sense security flaws of machine learning models. So 
given that, and given that we obviously, presumably, want to address these things, how do we go about preventing these sorts of attacks, right? And I would actually also offer the, the thesis that we, we kind of know, at least in theory, how to do this, right? So if the original work sort of came out um, the beginning of this, the, the past decade, maybe 10 years ago, um, very soon afterwards, there were, of course, methods presented for training networks that did not have these flaws, right? The, the classical one being adversarial training, which I actually will mention again in a second, but the idea is you just train kind of against these worst case perturbations, you incorporate them in your training, and that kind of works to prevent them. Simultaneously, or rather maybe shortly thereafter, um, we also did a lot of work on creating models that weren't, I mean, the problem with adversarial training is that we, we don't really know if it's gonna work or not, right? We don't really know if we've in fact created models that are robust, but then a lot of subsequent work came out on creating certified uh, robust models. So how to create models that we can, where we can guarantee or prove that at least under certain modifications of inputs, these models won't change their classification. Okay. And we've done all this and even the sort of, most recent ones on the right there are at this point in you know, machine learning terms, these are now kind of ancient, right? These are five, four, five years old in terms of papers. So the obvious question is, where are all the robust models? Because there aren't robust models out there, right? As far as I know, there's no deploy. I mean, people are deploying machine learning all over the place right now, and they're not deploying robust models. So why not? These are so great and we kind of know how to solve these things. Why, why aren't they there? So what this talk is about is sort of my opinionated take, opinionated take on this issue. I mean, I think everyone probably here has some obvious answers to this question. Like they just don't work that well and things like this, right? That's the obvious answer. But I think it's a bit deeper than that actually. So I wanna take you sort of through this question ask the question about why we don't have robust models yet. Um, but ask the question that even, you know, despite this, what progress, if, in, if any, have we made in this field? I think we have made progress in the past five years, even if we don't, haven't reached kind of widespread deployment of robust, robust models. And then talk about where we go from here. And I hope to, I hope to at least give a little bit different perspective on maybe what you've what you've heard before maybe not maybe you know all these things to be honest but hopefully give a little bit of context to so sort of at least my thoughts on this problem having worked in it um, for some time I should mention so we do have some time um, I'll shut it down if it gets too out of hand but <laughs> uh, if you want to ask questions in the talk by all means do um, we can be a little bit interactive here. We have some time. This is a relatively closed, you know, relatively small audience. Um, there will be time afterwards, of course, too, but, but certainly by all means, jump in and start asking questions if you, if you feel like it. All right, so first off, um, why don't we have robust models? And I think the answer to this, uh, actually maybe there's, there's many answers to this, but to highlight one answer, I actually wanna highlight a quote uh, from my student, Jeremy. And Jeremy actually is the, the author of the randomized smoothing paper. So he's uh, someone of, of some note in the, in the adversarial, uh, adversarial robustness community. And um, he sent out this great tweet. Didn't get enough credit, to be honest. This tweet is, is brilliant. Um, he sent it out and, and uh, comparing sort of the reality of, of adversarial attacks on machine learning systems or what you would might call attacks in the systems versus what we think of these things. So his, his quote here is that machine learning researchers say that, you know, an adversary could attack a self-driving car by using gradient descent and input space to construct a small but imperceptible adversarial patch, which could be applied to a stop sign. And then there's an article uh, in the New York Times highlighting maybe some actual attacks on self-driving cars. And these involve people sort of waving guns at the cars and shooting tires out and driving their Jeep in front of the car to run it off the road, or at least stop it from, from doing that. Um, I should also mention he published this in, in this, this tweet in uh, the, end, <laughs> the end of 2018, which was actually before his randomized smoothing paper. Um, so the point that I wanna make in all of this is that we all know this, right? To a certain extent, this is, this, is, this is not a new idea to us. 
The idea of LP robustness or even patch-based robustness, this was always supposed to be a toy problem that in some sense was a good proxy for the kinds of things that might happen in the real world, but not the end result, right? This was always the case that these things were nice illustrations. We would not, we, uh, this wasn't new to us, right? We, we knew people weren't gonna always really, this was not the easiest vector to attack uh, AI systems in the wild, but yet it seemed useful as sort of a toy example. But the problem is this toy problem has proven extremely hard in practice. And so to do this, I actually wanna take an example that's, that's by Jacob Steinhardt, who's the, gonna be giving a tutorial um, on Friday. Friday, yes. Um, maybe talking about this kind of stuff. But I think this is actually a great example um, to highlight like just how hard this problem actually is, the robustness problem. So Jacob uh, for, uh, surveyed four different tasks in machine learning. Um, so there was like a mathematics data set, like uh, requiring you to derive proofs of some simple mathematical results, a multiple choice exams uh, data set, a video classification data set in red here, and then adversarial robustness. This is actually just, this is the one that's the easiest to describe. It's just CIFAR 10 uh, adversarial performance under an L-infinity bound of eight over 255. Okay, so that's that, 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 that's that question, um, the, the green line there. And what I'm showing on the, you know, this is actually an interesting plot, it's all in the future, uh, <laughs> the years there. But what he actually did was he surveyed people about what they thought the performance level would be on these tasks over the next of that point five years. So 2022 is when it started, or sorry, it was when it um, was launched before 2021, I guess. 2022 uh, in June, this was the, um, the sort of the first year. Then the next year will be 2023 on June 30th, I believe. Okay. And what I'm showing here are sort of the, the expert opinions on where we would be uh, on each of those benchmark tasks at that year. Right, so all that really matters here, actually, to be honest, is the 2022 uh, plot, because that's where, you know, that's, what, that's the data we've gotten back so far. Um, but you can see sort of what we thought, how we thought we would do in the future as well. And these are, you know, AI researchers that made these predictions, people that should know this pretty well. So I'm going to show you now uh, in STAR, at least for the last year, June, 3rd, uh, June 30th, 2022, where we got. So um, in math, we actually got quite a bit higher. We got about a little bit, I think, right around 50%. Two days, interestingly, before the competition deadline, this, 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 was, this was the, the Minerva system by Google, um, two days before the competition sort of cut off, like we had a huge breakthrough, or at least a huge breakthrough on the benchmark. They claimed it was incidental, but I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, similarly, the uh, multiple exam choice, the multiple choice exams uh, going up, now you probably all heard you know talk about like chat GPT passing the bar and various medical exams and stuff like that too. And a little bit less less so, but video classification also um, we we did quite a bit better than the you know, we I say you know, <laughs> whoever built that best performing model did did a little better than predictions forecasted. Um, but of course, the one I'm leaving out here is adversarial robustness. It turns out we were it's the one. A little delay there. It's the one case um, where we substantially underperformed our prediction. And in fact, that's not even a really good, that's, that's not even a uh, really talking about how bad that prediction really was, because the reality is that level is exactly the same level we had um, at the start of the competition. So if you look at the leaderboard on robustbench.github.io, uh, which is like a common benchmark for this, the, the, the best entry is actually from March 2021. It's almost two years old now. There aren't a lot of deep learning problems where there have not been progress, has not been any progress in two years. And you could argue this is okay, people aren't, don't care about this problem anymore. We've moved on as a field, but I, but I don't know. I mean, I'd like to solve this a little better. We just can't do it. And so the sad truth of this may be genuinely that this problem that we all knew was a toy problem to begin with is actually genuinely impossible to solve with current approaches. So we'll come back to that later. But that's, a, that's sort of a stark reality that we may have to face 
in this field as a whole. All right, so with that sort of happy introduction, let's talk about what we have done. Because I don't think we've made no progress here as, as a field. Um, but we clearly haven't solved the problem either. So I want to talk a little bit about what progress we have made. And I guess the way I would emphasize it, as I was emphasized, you know, in the different areas of robustness, what do I personally, and, and I should emphasize here, this part is, the first and the last part are more about the field as a whole. This next part is going to be about sort of work coming out of my group. So it's not the most interesting things I think are in the field period. It's sort of what have been some of my key takeaways uh, from the work that, that my students have done. Um, but I'll at the end then pop back out to talk about like, what do I think this says for the field as a whole? So I think in my mind, there are sort of three core themes or areas that by which I partition the world of adversarial robustness. All right? And I, I'm obviously biased here because I, I work in certified robustness. So I dig in a little bit more <laughs> To, to this sort of half of the world here. Um, but if you sort of think about the, the classical approaches that we have, or I guess I guess I could use the word classical at this point, um, to describe the approaches that we currently have to build robust machine learning models, I would argue that there are three broad classes of approaches. There are empirically robust models. This is basically dominated by adversarial training. There are other sort of add-ins as well. But these are all approaches that achieve kind of seemingly are resilient to the best of our ability to attack them, but where we don't have real proofs that they definitely work, or at least they're not sort of trained with those proofs in mind. We also have deterministic certified robustness. So, so systems where we can prove that they are robust to certain sets of perturbations um, using what typically amount to some sort of convex relaxation over the reachable set. And then finally, we have probabilistic certified robustness, which usually uses some technique of smoothing the classifier, like randomized smoothing, but there are other examples as well, um, to provide a guarantee, not necessarily on the original classifier, but on the smooth classifier. So that's how I, that's how I very simplistically divide the world up. Let me talk about each of these in turn and talk about what I think my biggest takeaway over the past five years has been in each of these areas. So let's talk about, um, it's getting like a longer and longer delay <laughs> between my, my slide and that. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about first, empirical robustness. So the most common way that I would describe empirical robustness, I don't have too much math on these slides, but I have a few slides with math. It's not important to understand the details here. Hopefully the, the high level here is understandable. Um, the high level of empirical robustness, and really I would say adverse, I mean, arguably this whole actually equation is applied to adversarial robustness, adversarial robustness in general, is that when we're trying to minimize uh, the loss of a classifier, which is what we usually do on the right here, or the, sorry, on the left here, right? We're minimizing some sort of expectation of, of data points drawn from some distribution, minimizing the, the loss of our classifier H on it, right? Where theta here are the parameters of our classifier. Um, the, the switch we make when we start talking about adversarial robustness, and there are different variants of this as well, of course, but the, the simplest variant, is that instead of thinking about just sort of our empirical loss on those X, Y pairs, we think instead about the, some worst case loss where we're maximizing, an adversary is maximizing our loss over some perturbation delta in some allowable set uh, big delta. Okay, and simple, you know, usually this is phrased as a additive perturbation to the input, but of course you can have more complex versions where it's a, some other perturbation in some other form, some arbitrary function of the perturbation and X, et cetera. And what adversarial training tries to do is it tries to just basically solve this 
I mean, this, you know, this is an optimization problem here, but this is an optimization problem here on the right too. It's just a robust optimization problem instead of a classical one, right? Or instead of a purely empirical one. And so what adversarial training tries to do is it just does basically what amounts to robust optimization of this objective here. And the procedure is really quite simple, right? All you do is you just incorporate those worst case perturbations into your training. And by some sort of really simple math about sub, it's actually not that simple if you look at it, but we all treat it as simple, kind of math about subgradients and the properties of subgradients. Um, what you can say is that if you want to actually take gradients of this top right problem, you proceed in two steps. You first find the worst case perturbation. So you find the delta star that actually achieves that maximum for a given x, y pair. And then you would just take a gradient step at that worst case perturbation. And there's, I mean, you can justify this as the true gradient via things like Danskin's theorem and stuff like this, but that's actually sort of beside the point. The intuition here is really simple. It's just that if you want to minimize worst case loss, you first find those worst case examples and you train on those instead of the original example, right? And that's what adversarial training is. The problem, of course, is that you can't actually solve that worst case optimization problem, at least not for the classifiers we care about typically, i.e. deep networks. And so in practice, what adversarial training does is it tries to approximate that inner solution with some approximation like projected gradient descent or something like this. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that this simple technique or very minor variants are still the state of the art in attaining practical empirical robustness of classifiers. Right? All those leaderboard entries, they basically use this or very small variants of this. So what's my biggest lesson of practical adversarial training over the past five years. The amazing thing, and I think this is actually not well appreciated precisely because we made the opposite point for a very long time in the field. But I wanna emphasize one thing here, which I think is really underappreciated when it comes to adversarial training. And that is the fact that adversarial training is actually amazingly resilient to finding very, very bad solutions of that inner problem. Nicholas might be looking at me askew back there from the back because he makes the opposite point very often. But this is true, right? So, so the best sort of like PGD adversarial training takes like 10 gradient steps for PGD. Or people do that in practice, right? We know that if you actually want to find the worst case Sort of real adversarial examples, you do much better by taking many, many more steps, right? But it turns out that when you care about crafting just the lost landscape of these classifiers, for some reason that I frankly think we don't fully understand yet, it is often sufficient to do an extremely bad job of the inner optimization problem. Right? So much so, in fact, that in many cases, and this is actually a paper that we had a few years ago, we can, in fact, just take a single gradient step. This was an algorithm originally proposed called FGSM. It was the, I guess, actually the sort of the, the original adversarial training method. Um, just to take the single gradient step to the edge of the, of the perturbation region, just trains on that point. For a long time, this was sort of widely derided as completely broken as a technique because it just, you know, that was not a good enough thing to train against at training time. That was a bad inner approximation. And you had to use better inner approximations like 10 steps instead of one step, which is an equally bad approximation, I would argue, but a little bit better and it kind of worked. 
But what we showed in some of this work, and this is, I mean, to be clear, it doesn't work as well as taking 10 steps. 10 steps is better, no question. Um, but it works okay if you do things like add a little bit of noise. And actually, there are a number of sort of theories about what is actually making this work well, like alignment of the gradient with other things, stuff like that. Um, so I think we got a little lucky with this paper too. Like at the exact levels we were testing, randomization was sufficient to achieve this effect. If you go a little bit further, it's no longer sufficient. So, so um, we got a bit lucky here. But to be very clear, um, these really bad methods for inner optimization kind of work okay. And I don't actually understand why this is the case, to be clear, still. I mean, I think it has something to do, again, with smoothing the loss landscape and encouraging smoothness overall, encouraging lower Lipschitz constants of your function, sure. But, but I don't really understand it because there are other cases in robust optimization where if you don't solve that inner problem exactly, you are in really bad luck, right? If you train for 100 steps of PGD and then evaluate it on 200, you would be equally broken. And for whatever reason, that doesn't happen here. I think we need to appreciate kind of the, the amazingness of this to a certain extent. Okay, so that's my, that's I think one of the biggest takeaways that I've had over the past five years in the field of kind of empirical robustness. So what about deterministic certified robustness with convex relaxations? So to be clear, what I mean by this is the following. And this is some work that in, in, you know, was done by several Gacha groups, I would say simultaneously um, in the sort of beginning of 2018 or so. Um, our approach for doing it was using kind of dual problems and things like that, but I don't wanna uh, get into it that too much because to a large extent, they're actually all very, very similar. The basic idea of deterministic robustness is that we know we can't solve that inner maximization problem in adversarial training or in adversarial robustness in general. But what we can do, and, and the reason why we can't solve it is that when you take sort of nice convex regions in input space uh, for your classifier and feed them through a deep network, what you get out are really nasty, non-convex regions that you have to reason over combinatorially. Right, so I can't find sort of you know the worst case examples in these images of these perturbation sets through a neural network because those images are combinatorial. They are too complex to enumerate. And so you can't actually do this in closed form. But what you can do is you can outer bound those regions with in some sense, nice sets. Those sets could be just boxes, like you have often in interval bound propagation, or they could be more complex kind of polytopes, like we like we did in some of our original work here, and like was done actually in a lot of in a lot of follow on works as well. And then the idea is, we change this problem to be instead of maximizing over the true perturbation set here, we sort of maximize what what I would kind of say. I mean, I'm, I'm being a bit. Uh, loose here because really and sometimes this set is on the last layer not the input space but don't worry about that too much what you can think about it intuitively is doing is it's sort of maximizing kind of a worst case perturbation in this outer approximation set right and that because these sets are nice we can do that because these sets are nice convex sets we can we can find their worst case perturbation and we can get Bound. And, and by the way, of course, then, if this worst case perturbation, you know, lies outside, lies on the all on one side of the classifier, then we know that no real perturbation could lie, could sort of change the class label either, right? And that's the intuition of deterministic kind of relaxation-based certifiable robustness. We form outer approximations of the reachable set, and if that outer approximation is all safe, then we're good. Okay, so in this area, what's my biggest takeaway over the past five years? Well, to give a bit of background here, um, I was very excited when we first found these things. I thought, okay, this, 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 this is gonna be our, solve our problem, right? We just, we have 
guaranteed bounds on these things. We can just train those guaranteed bounds and we have robust classifiers. Well, it turns out we did that. And if you think your performance is, you know, not good enough with adversarial training, well, you're going to be sad because it's even worse with these certified, certifiably robust methods, right? Essentially, what happens is in order to get guarantees that your classifier cannot be manipulated to cross the boundary of the classification region, you have to heavily over-regularize it to the point where it just doesn't really work that well. But the other problem, of course, is that these bounds themselves were incredibly loose. Okay, so these bounds, they are outer bounds, but you know, the, the picture I'm showing here is probably a bit misleading because they look like nice tight sort of regions around the space. They are incredibly loose compared to the actual reachable sets of these classifiers. Right, which also means that you know we oftentimes can't really say anything about a classifier, whether it's you know even for even for ones that uh, that seem to work really well, right? If you if, if you try to like, use these bounds on, for example, an adversarially trained classifier, just to verify that it is in fact robust, the bounds are just too big, and you can't do anything. You can't use them. Like it will cover the whole space there, and even if the real region does not cross the boundary, the bound is just is, is essentially vacuous. So the biggest surprise I've had over the past five years is a slow acceptance that maybe we actually can start to think reasonably about more combinatorial, more exact solutions to these essentially what amount to neural network verification problems. Right? So the reason why we designed convex outer approximations in the first place is that I said, sorry for sitting back and forth a bunch, but I said, enumerating these regions is impossible. You can't do that for neural networks. And one thing that has really surprised me over the past four, and, and, and to be clear, that's still, to a, you know, that's still true for the truly large networks. Right? I mean, for even for medium scale networks, that's still true. But what I've been really surprised about is just how well these convex relaxations method, these convex relaxation methods are as essentially inner solvers for real combinatorial search. And by real combinatorial search, I basically mean branch and bounds techniques. So I, I for a long time, I mean, networks have hundreds of thousands at mo, you know, at least of hidden units in the middle, right? Things that could be either positive or negative, and you know you can't therefore bound it because because you, you can't reason about that because that's a nonlinear function that you have if you have a ReLU over a, a, a neuron that can be positive or negative. Um, so to actually compute that true reachable set that winds up being a combinatorial problem, it's an integer program, and the way we solve integer programs typically is via branch and bound. But if you take a neural network and feed it into a branch and bound solver like Cplex or Garobi, it just completely craps out. There's, there's, there's no hope whatsoever of solving these things. But what I've been amazed to find is that actually, I mean, we're still talking about combinatorial search here. So we're still, you know, we're still slow. <laughs> we're, not, we're not getting there uh, when, it comes to, when it comes to sort of verifying, you know, GPT-like transformers. But we're getting really good. We're making sort of amazing progress. All that progress that we haven't been making on, you know, accuracies and robustness, we have been making like 10x progress each year on our ability to verify larger and larger scales of neural networks given these solvers as kind of an inner loop. And the, the tool I want to highlight here is actually a tool by my postdoc, uh, Huan Zhang. Um, it's a tool called Alpha Beta Crown. And it's a essentially a branch and bound solver. So it combines three things. It combines basically this sort of outer bounds as a whole. He has different pictures for these things, but it's sort of outer bounds as a whole. Plus they actually optimize terms of those outer bounds in a convex way to make them tighter, but that only goes so far. And so then ultimately you need to use branch and bound. And when I say branch and bound, what I mean is you basically take your, your reachable sets, the reason why they're non-convex and all weirdly shaped is because you have nonlinear functions in your networks like ReLUs. 
And so what branch and bound does is it splits these values into two portions, their positive portion and the negative portion where things are actually both linear. And then sort of, you know, subdivides up your domain until it can finally sort of capture it exactly. Now, this sounds crazy. And I thought for a long time this was sort of hopeless because there are a lot of ReLUs in a deep network. But it seems at least that we are doing some rather large improvements on the scale of networks we can verify. And this software, I think, is really, and this is both, you know, so that's just, just this points to a GitHub page with the software, but I think it's really sort of um, improving to an amazing extent what's possible uh, with verification. And in fact, in the last two years, this solver has won a sort of well publicized competition on verification of neural networks called VNN Comp. It won in both 2021 and 2022. And in both cases, it didn't only win, it actually sort of got almost a perfect score. So it almost won all the different challenges, essentially. Um, and if you look at kind of just one sort of detailed plot here, um, what I'm showing here is, this is a little hard to read up the slide, but um, what I'm showing here is the number of problems we're able to verify versus the time we spend uh, verifying them on the y-axis. And so you want to be kind of down to the right here. You want to be kind of immediately verifying all your instances in no time. And uh, these techniques essentially use increasing levels of complexity, and some of them are older and some of them are newer, but you can kind of sort of see the progress we've been making over the years. Remember, this is uh, a log scale of time here. Um, so we've been making a lot of progress when it comes to our ability to verify larger and larger networks. And to be clear, the core of sort of the value proposition for these techniques is that branch and bound involves in parallel checking kind of bounds for very for a lot of very similar problems. They're not quite the same, so you can't, they're not like trivially parallelizable. In fact, existing branch and bound solvers don't use GPUs very often, also because the underlying like linear programming solvers didn't use GPUs. But the key idea of our technique is really just that. If you combine GPU solving with uh, branch and bound, that's like a really, really good combination. And you can get solver times that are three or four orders of magnitude faster than if you just use sort of your off the shelf. I mean, I, should, I say off the shelf, but things like Garobi, for those that know, those are really heavily optimized. And you get things that are, again, three orders of magnitude faster than Garobi uh, or Cplex and things like this. So the last thing I'll say, um, takes me to my sort of last point I want to emphasize of, of one of my lessons over the past five years, is on randomized, is on probabilistic robustness, i.e. randomized smoothing. So the idea of randomized smoothing, um, I want to say, you know, we weren't the first to do this, and I in my first slide, actually highlighted a few other papers of people that were doing very similar things before our paper. But I think our papers kind of become one of the standard techniques for how people present and think about these sort of randomization and smoothing techniques to, to, to guarantee robustness. The idea of randomized smoothing is that um, what causes adversarial examples in some very hypothetical, like, high dimensional sense that we can't visualize because we can't visualize high dimensional spaces. But what causes them are sort of, you know, points that are classified correctly, i.e., you know, that, that, that pig is classified correctly. Somewhere very nearby in input space, right, is a point that's classified incorrectly, which is kind of like, you know, and most points they were classified correctly, but like there's some like really nasty kind of like set of bad examples kind of jutting in to your input space to classify things incorrectly. But like the measure of this set is kind of small in theory, right? It's like a small set that, that you sort of want that you, you would imagine is a sort of small set of, of these examples. The idea of randomized something is very simple. It's to say, okay, instead of just predicting, you know, taking an X and predicting at that point, which could be shifted to there, what we're going to do is we're actually going to randomly sample a bunch of Gaussian noise uh, to perturb our input. So we're going to kind of think about perturbing our input under this distribution here and use a majority vote over the classification of those perturbations 
to classify our, our example, right? So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll generate a bunch of samples, we'll classify them all, and then we'll use the majority vote of all those samples to predict the, the class. And that actually, it's both intuitive that that would help, right? Because if, if these adversarial regions are sort of, you know, bad things jutting into the space, this might help. But what turns out to be really cool about this is that you can actually prove this works. So people have been doing randomization for a long time before we proved anything about it. But what's very cool is you can actually prove that it works. And the high level kind of, you know, one sentence reason about why how the randomized smoothing proof works is that essentially you can prove that for this procedure, the best thing an adversary could do to fool you would actually be to, you, uh, to make the classifier linear in some sort of formal way. That's the worst case thing they could do. And for a linear classifier, you can derive an exact bound on the robustness of this system. Like if they're trying to fool the randomized smoothing procedure, the best thing they could do would be a linear classifier. You can prove a, what the axial robustness is for that linear classifier, like what it would be for that linear system. And therefore this serves as a bound for any classifier. And in fact, the kind of crazy thing about, about randomized smoothing, which I think everyone kind of knows or appreciates at this point, is that it doesn't depend on the classifier at all, right? Like it doesn't matter if it's a deep network or anything else. The classifier is a black box as far as randomized smoothing is concerned, um, but it's able to still do a very good job at, uh, I mean, relatively speaking, do a good job at getting guarantees for any arbitrary classifier. Now, um, what's my biggest lesson here? There have been a lot of advances to randomized smoothing, I should add. Um, many sort of by myself and collaborators, but also uh, many by many others in the field too. But the point I actually want to highlight about randomized smoothing is not those advances, or like that's, that's actually not the biggest takeaway for me over the past five years. The biggest takeaway for me is that I think that randomized smoothing offers us the best potential to leverage large pre-trained models for building robust classifiers. Okay, so let me, let me say what I mean by this. We are kind of in a world of large-scale, robust, pre-trained models. Sorry, not robust. Large-scale, non-robust, just normal, pre-trained models in machine learning. All right? So I very rarely train a classifier from scratch anymore, right? If I want like a really good image classifier, you know, I'll download some vision transformer pre-trained on the entire internet or something like that, right? Um, this is a good thing or a bad thing. I think there's some debate about this, right? Like, is this, a, is this the way we should be going? But it, it is the reality right now. And part of the problem in robustness is that we're not getting those robust models trained on those ever-increasing scales. And maybe it's not necessarily even a good idea to do that. I mean, they just don't work that well. They don't seem like we haven't been able to scale them that well. Um, you know, if, if the best we can do is like 60 some percent on CIFAR, do we really want to be investing our time in training large models? Are they useful? Probably not. Just practically speaking, probably no one's going to do it. Given all the other flaws we've seen in, in robustness, probably no one will train those large scale pre-trained models to be robust. So the question then is how do we use, how can we leverage pre-trained models in robustness? And the problem here is that randomized smoothing doesn't work with sort of pre-trained models because randomized smoothing requires classifiers to be robust, not to adversarial perturbations, but to Gaussian noise. Okay, and that's actually a, still a tall order because most classifiers are not robust to Gaussian noise, right? Because again, you're sort of, just to be clear here, randomized smoothing is classifying a bunch of Gaussian perturbations to your image. These are actually very large perturbations when it comes to sort of getting practical bounds. And classifiers by default will not be good at that. So you have to train a classifier on Gaussian perturbations of your images in order to actually use randomized smoothing. Um, but maybe not. So what we proposed uh, a few years ago was a technique called denoised smoothing. And the idea is, it's kind of a weird thing to do here, but here's what you do. You take your image, you add noise, like in randomized smoothing, 
And then you try to denoise them. So you add noise and you denoise it. It's very weird, but that's what you do. Then you take these denoise image, feed them into a pretrain classifier. And because those are approximately denoised, the classifier has a chance of working well. And it gives you a bunch of predictions. And you take the majority vote. And the point is that this whole combination of pretrain denoiser and pretrain classifier is also just a black box system. So what we're doing in this process is we're applying randomized smoothing to this joint black box system of denoiser followed by classifier. And in doing so, we were actually able to get, you know, not as good as the original randomized smoothing paper, but reasonable performance using nothing but pre-trained models. Right? But let's take it a step further. Um, because you know where we've really made progress in the past five years? Is models that try to remove Gaussian noise from images. Like we've made a ton of progress there, right? Not for not because people care about that task, but that's that's how you generate images with diffusion models. And so actually with Nicholas, who's who's back there too, um, we had a paper or coming out a paper this um, this year at iClear on basically just using denoise smoothing with diffusion models instead of the original denoisers we used originally, right? So so we used just some off-the-shelf denoisers before. Um, based upon some sort of, I forget even the architecture. They, they were sort of for image denoising, right? Um, diffusion models are really good at denoising. And by the way, they're also really good at denoising like when you tell them the noise level. And by the way, it's fine to tell these things the noise level too, right? That's like totally valid here to just tell them the noise level. And so these are like the absolute perfect fit possible for these things. And it turns out when we do this, when we combine really a state-of-the-art denoiser, pre-trained denoiser for diffusion models with a state-of-the-art kind of large-scale transformer, we get performance that is better, better than the original randomized smoothing paper, which trained a classifier from scratch. Right? Like better by quite a bit, in fact, like from... Originally, we had like 59, 49% uh, uh, robust performance to 71% uh, here. So we're able to actually leverage all these advances. I mean, you know, probably if you trained that same architecture from scratch, which, I, I mean, it's, it's an enormous architecture, right? This is one of these vision transformers that's just huge. You could do better, but we just don't have the time or, and no one's going to have the time for that. So this offers us, randomized smoothing actually offers us an avenue for leveraging these pre-trained models. And that's actually one of the things that I think is coolest about these, you know, a really unexpected advantage of randomized smoothing. Okay. So now I want to sort of pop back out again and talk at a high level about like, where do we go from here? Because I can't help but think that I didn't really address, uh, in the second part, I didn't really address any of the criticisms in the first part, right? So I mentioned like, yeah, we're making some advances. We can verify small scale networks now. Um, we are able to, you know, adversarial training kind of works to a certain degree, but it still doesn't work well enough to actually get good performance, right? It's just, it kind of works surprisingly. Then we can leverage pre-trained models, but we're still just so far behind. I mean, not, not, so far is like a is like a doesn't even capture it, right? Where no one would ever deploy one of these models because they work so badly, all for the sake of defending against what amounts to a toy threat model against of, of attacks. Right? Why would you ever do that? So I really do think this raises a reasonable question about whether robustness actually matters or not in machine learning. And I do think that sort of as a community, we should take this pretty seriously as a question, first of all. 
And I think the trend, if I were to sort of capture what I think the trend has been, the way we dealt with this question over the past five years, which is a trend I haven't mentioned yet, for reasons you'll see in a second, is that people sort of, the way we've dealt with this is we've redefined the problem. Right, so robustness as a technical term, right? And it is a technical term in the, in the form of robust optimization sort of things, right? What it means is, it means worst case performance over some performance set, or some, some pre-specified set, excuse me. Right, that's what, that's what it is to be robust, right? Robust is a min-max problem. That's like the, at least mathematically, that's what we mean by robustness. Um, but this doesn't work, right? We can't build models that are robust. So what's happened is that instead, we've defined robustness. I would maybe much more in the colloquial sense is what people really mean when they say robust models. But I would argue kind of a bit confusingly in the sense of robustness means it performs well kind of outside the original test set in some way, right? And actually, if you're, I mean, don't get, don't get me wrong, I, I, I get this, right? If you're a company that wants to sell machine learning and people are concerned about systems not working, they don't care about sort of min-max problems, right? They don't probably even really care about worst case, truly worst case performance. They sort of care, like, is it going to work if I deploy it, right? Right now, the answer usually is, is, is no very often, right? Because they're very, very brittle. And so what people mean by robustness is something a little bit more than that, right? Like distribution shift, that's robustness now, right? Like the natural distribution you see in between uh, source and target domains, that's, that's robustness. You know, common corruptions is robustness now. Um, just generalization <laughs> is robustness, right? You see that a lot, actually. Um, and as I said, like the real thing people really mean is like, does it just work reasonably well when I deploy it? And I think if you, if, 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 you know, I was giving this talk maybe six months ago, I probably would have actually pitched some of these things as like the, the, the way the field is going and the way we should think about robustness going forward because real robustness, at least we would, you know, adversarial robustness, I should specify, is, is just not a good paradigm. And it's one where um, it doesn't really matter in practice, seemingly. And so these things do matter. And therefore, these are the things we should focus on as a field. And that's a totally reasonable argument. I think actually there are probably some position papers here I saw that I, I would argue kind of make similar arguments in some sense, right? That like, it has been our failing as a field to focus too much on adversarial robustness, which isn't a real problem. And therefore we need to shift the field accordingly to deal with things that really matter. It's a totally valid argument. I've made that argument many times. But at least here, and this is actually the first time I've made this argument, so in like a public, a public venue. So let me ask you a question, which is what do you see in that image? Right, you probably see a pig, I'm guessing. That's actually the, that, that's the adversarial one too, right? So you probably couldn't even tell which one it is. I think I've actually been managed to tell it, like there's some stuff up here where I look at this like so often, not in this screen, because the screen's really hard to see, but I've looked at this picture enough that I actually can differentiate the adversarial one, the non-adversarial one. Um, <laughs> can tell when, <laughs> when you've worked in a field too long, right? But we all see, we all see a pig there. I don't think, I mean, people have argued this. I think it's completely bogus. I don't think if you backpropped through my visual cortex, that you could create a perturbation that had two out of 255 degrees, your pixel differences, that I would think was an airplane. I don't think so. I don't think anyone, really, I mean, 
if you run one of those black box, these, these can be also fooled by black box methods, right? If you run a black box, like an attacker on me, I, I mean, I'll get bored. So you have to you know, classify a thousand images um, or like a million sometimes, right? But I, I don't think you, you could attack my visual system if you did that. This seems to be an important point, right? What is it about, I mean, Let's let's like get back to the fundamental problem that made these examples so cool to begin with. They are examples that we obviously as humans can solve. That are not a problem for us, yet they uniformly break every single machine learning system we have. And after five years, they still break them. That seems pretty interesting. I mean, is it a matter of, of data, right? So so a, a common theme, I think is that you know human we, we just have so much data we're exposed to like from when we're born right that that's that's what causes us to be robust to these things but that's the trend we're going with machine learning by the way right training them on the internet and those systems training the internet are not any more robust than these things we are not gaining robustness through massive pre-training not adversarial robustness at least and somehow like this strikes me as a big deal Right, so we are living in a time where people are making all this fuss about differentiating between the output of machine learning models versus human output. Not in this context, of course, in other contexts, and in different contexts. But in this environment, isn't it pretty interesting that we have an example of a problem that humans can all solve trivially and machines cannot solve? The protocol is different, right? It's not a Turing, like you can't do like a one-shot test with a, with a machine. Um, But in the age where like the Turing test as it was originally conceived is, is arguably not good enough anymore because people are too gullible and trusting of the, and, and too sort of assuming that someone talking in English is in fact a human. It seems pretty important that we have a very clear empirical example of a very stark difference between what machines can do right now, what current machine learning models can do and what people can do. And so the last thing I'll say here is I'll actually kind of give a bit of a defense for why this is still a really cool problem to think about. And it's not because we need to solve adversarial robustness in order to deploy machine learning in scenarios X, Y, and Z. That probably is not true. Or at least we're going to have to find ways around it if we want to deploy it there, because we're probably not going to solve this problem. I think this is an interesting problem because we as researchers should be motivated by problems that seem impossible right now. And this problem seems really impossible right now. We just don't know how to solve these things. And so I know it's become kind of unfashionable to even talk about adversarial robustness. Because I do think that the implication always is that like this is about security concerns. And yes, there are big security concerns of these things. But I think the real sort of cool aspect here is that this is an instance of a problem right now, you know, in a time where these things are sort of falling uh, one at a time, right? All these dominoes are falling over. The fact that we have one of those forecasting challenges where we routinely underestimate or overestimate the ability of machine learning models, um, that's a really important thing to have. So I'm happy to consider ordinary adversarial robustness. And I'll even say one more thing, which is that what I hope to see actually is a bit more creativity in dealing with that problem. And I know that this is actually somewhat um, out of character for me, 
Because in the past, I've, I've been extremely dismissive of a lot of what I would argue are the more sort of ad hoc or heuristic or weird approaches to trying to deal with adversarial attacks. I think when the, when the, when the problem first emerged in the scene, and people said, oh, well, you know, the reason why humans are, can, can do this is that we have generative models where we see the picture and we generate a, a mirror image, like a copy of it. And that's what, you know, let's, let's do something like that in a generative model in our, in our classifiers as well. Those things clearly, none of them worked, right? They were clearly all broken. Uh, uh, Nicholas did break a lot of those things, right? So, so but those don't work. But I also don't think that adversarial training actually works either. I don't think anything we know works. But that in some sense is the whole point, right? We have a problem where we have no clue how to solve with current techniques and good reason to think that current techniques will not solve the problem. Is this tied in some fundamental way to you know, human intelligence versus machine intelligence? I don't know. I, I really don't. Like, I mean, maybe, maybe this is some, you know, some irredeemable part of our of our human intelligence is like tied to the ability to not have adversarial examples like this. Maybe, maybe not. But the point is, it is still a differentiating factor, and I think it's time to reevaluate whether this can, in fact, lead to some fresh ideas about machine learning as a whole. Yes, not forgetting lessons we've learned. Don't just like make stuff up, test it on one case and say, yes, it's robust, it solves the problem. Don't do that. Um, but let's, let's get creative again a little bit. So thanks very much. <laughs>